Hello and welcome back to Booklust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at University Bookstore is novelist and short story writer Paul Yoon. Paul, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. I'm very grateful. Oh, well, I have to say that I loved, I loved your new book, Run Me to Earth. You know, there are some books that, that you could read on, on your um, electronic reader that you could read on Kindle and it's perfectly fine. But I have to say that your books are just books that are so beautifully made as books that, that it would be cruel to deny yourself the pleasure <laughs> of holding the book and you, the deckled edges, the beautiful color of the pages. But that doesn't even say anything about about the writing in the book, which well, is. Well, thank you. But it's the perfect size also. You can slip it into your bag. Right. Um, and they've been very kind to me. They, uh, Simon Schuster, and, and we've worked with the same designer for all three books. And um, it's meant a lot that they've cared about the, the, the physical book itself. Yes. As yeah. much as sort of the words inside it, too. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. that that's, it's, I'm, that's, it's not unusual, but you don't run across books that just demand to be read as a book, yeah. um, as often as one would think. Well, I mean, you could relate to this, though. All I remember of growing up, I was a huge reader growing up, and, you know, bookstores were sort of my lifeline. And so just that, that excitement of picking up a book, taking it out of the shelf, holding it, right. seeing the cover. I know we're not supposed to judge books by covers, but, you know, when I was younger, I was, I was looking at covers. Right. I was looking at covers to see what was inside. I was holding it. And so all of that is, is very special to me. What, yeah. So what books, what did you read as a kid? As a kid? I'm trying to remember. Uh, the Great Brain series. Uh -huh. Oh, The Great Brain. Yeah. Yes, John love D. Them. Fitzgerald. Yeah, I love that. Um, of course, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. Um, and yes, those are sort of my three. Um, Your go-to kind of series. Out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then I think I sort of, as I grew older, I slipped into, I think I had a, you know, like a spy thriller phase, uh -huh. although I, I'm blanking on, you know, the writers. John le Carre had a huge influence yeah. on me, yeah, growing right. up, yeah. And yeah, and yeah I, I think in some ways with John le Carre, uh, the writing, like your writing, is so pared down. I mean, your writing is even more pared down. It's like poetry, where in your books, one of the things that struck me was that everything Everything that happens happens between the lines that you've written in a way. Is that fair? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think artistically I've always been intrigued by how to present something epic and vast in a minimal, in the most minimal spare way as possible. Um, I'm drawn to paintings that do that. I'm drawn to films that do that. Um, so, Who are some painters or filmmakers then that you... Oh, Rothko. Uh -huh. I love Rothko. Um, and um, I would say Cezanne has been always a big influence on me. Um, and uh, even Pollock, who I would, you know, I think toes a line between, you know, just sort of energy and vastness, but also there's so much control in, in right. those lines, right? Yeah. Um, yep. So that's always intriguing to me in terms of films. Terrence Malick is is someone I grew up watching, um, Wong Kar Wai as well, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. When you were writing Run Me to Earth, mm -hmm. yeah. or The Snow Hunters, yeah. was it difficult to be in that mindset? Well, maybe, maybe before you answer that, yeah. maybe we should give a, a kind of, um, the elevator description of, of Run Me to Earth. Run Me to Earth, yeah. sure, so absolutely. How, do you, how would you describe it? So in the late 1960s during the Vietnam War, um, Eisenhower um, coined this sort of domino theory that was going on in Southeast Asia where um, these countries surrounding Vietnam were on the verge of falling to communism. Then if you removed one domino, perhaps that tumbling, that cascade would stop. And so they decided to choose a tiny country next to Vietnam, the size of Utah, um, to remove that domino. And thus began a covert operation with the US Air Force and the CIA 
uh, to first train, to go in there and train ethnic groups to help fight the communists, um, the communist Patet Lao, um, and also um, an aerial bombing campaign that would last nine years. Um, and within, within that, not those nine years, they dropped over two million tons of ordnance, which is more than was dropped on Germany and Japan combined during the Second World War um, across a country the size of Utah. And so essentially, it's, it's, that is the frame of the story that I, I decided to work on. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 I could not, when I stumbled upon that fact, I could not imagine it. It was so unfathomable to me that in some ways that made me need to try to imagine it or try to learn about it. Um, I think also I've been working on this, certain events of the say past three years um, had left me feeling afraid, uncertain, angry, frustrated, confused. And I think looking back, I, um, this fact, when I stumbled upon it, made me feel the same way. And in some ways, I sort of gravitated toward that because of what was going on um, in the past three years or so, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So was it difficult emotionally to spend all this, all the time that you wrote yeah. in this in this world, and especially the main characters in this book are three young people yeah. who are living through the bombing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was extremely difficult. Um, I'm a Pisces, and so you know, I don't know how to compartmentalize. <laughs> it's all it's all one river. <laughs> so uh, you know, working on this book, it was yeah to be in that mindset. I think not only. Uh, where your characters have suffered immeasurable loss, but also where you have this landscape, again, this landscape of where, where statistically the, the, the place that you're trying to survive is being bombed every eight minutes, 24 hours a day for nine years straight. Um, it was not a happy uh, place to live in, um, but in some ways, uh, some of the issues that I've been working on with this book or, or wrestling with were also ones that I was I, that I had worked on with Snow Hunters, and so you know these stories of of people who under you know undergo traumatic circumstances um, during wartime, the need for survival, that the need and and the attempt to rebuild an entire life again and start over and to create new identities um, in different places in these foreign places um, it's something I've been wrestling with very very seriously for the past ten years um, for the past three books um, and so in that way I don't want to say it easier is the right word but it was it was a it was a mentality that I have been in for so long that that um, there was a there was a foundation there for it. Did yeah. you did you do a lot of reading? Yeah, um, I did a lot of reading. Like I, what sorts of like? Um, it was a mix. It was a mix of, um, of of novels, looking for inspiration, which is always really important to me, mm -hmm. and textbooks, mm -hmm. um, which where that was the research that I was doing. Um, in terms of uh, what was going on during the bombing campaign and, and in the history of Laos. And uh, you know, I was never able to visit, so I was relying on textbooks and scholars and literature as well. Yeah. Do you think if you had gone there, yeah. would that have changed anything for you? I don't know. I don't know. That's tricky. I, um, when I was working on Snow Hunters, um, I never, uh, I was never able to go down to Brazil, uh -huh. um, and so it just happened that um, I've created these worlds um, without actually visiting them, and and I have mixed feelings about that. Uh -huh. um, I worry that, uh, you know, maybe uh, I would, I would have done better or created better books if I was able to set foot on them, um, but also a part of me. I'm intrigued by um, creating these worlds that sort of represent a very specific place, but also can represent 
a larger a larger yeah place it, right it, so yeah. and the commonalities of that and right. so I think I was always sort of towing that line uh -huh. for all three books yeah and you couldn't go back even in the best of circumstances to 1969. I mean, you can't replicate. Yes, exactly. You know, yeah. it would be a different, yeah. a, a different country yeah. with the scars of that yeah. of that yeah. period. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Where did these, where did these three characters um, come from? Oh, that's a really great question. I think I've always been interested in characters who uh, are have been isolated in some way. Um, uh, by sort of circumstances that are beyond their control. Um, and, you know, if I were to try to figure out why, my best guess is um, my grandfather, when he's a, he was born in the North and he's a, he was a North Korean refugee who fled to the South during the Korean War. And um, along the way, he was uh, able to uh, rescue um, a handful of orphans um, who had been caught up in the in the conflict, and so and then eventually started um, an orphanage slash school for them. And that's where my dad grew up in this school, and so um, and so those are the stories I had growing up. Were were children who um, did not have parents um, and were starting over again. So it was that, but I also again uh, stories of people who have who have undergone trauma during a conflict, but it had to rebuild and start over again, too. Um, and so I think for this particular story, because there was a lot of it that I didn't know about, and that's why I wanted to write about it, because, you know, writing is a kind of education, right? I want to learn about the world. Right. This is how I do so. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the foundations I needed and the, and the buoys, so to speak, were I think autobiographical in that way, where I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about uh, the children that my grandfather saved. Yeah, and so I think those th these characters sort of started there. Yeah. Did you did you know at the beginning of the book what would happen to oh, the no. three? Not at all. Um, you know, first. I'm definitely of the mindset that writing is sort of like baby steps in the dark. You just don't know. You just you just keep you keep moving one step forward um, and hoping that you know you you find the way out um, with with a lot of you know wrong turns and dead ends <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I knew what I knew was that I wanted to create a very big canvas and show different ways in which people survive, do not survive, rebuild, unable to rebuild, are trapped, whether that's physically or mentally, all of that. And so because I had created three characters and I knew that there were sort of side characters as well, what I promised myself was that this book would show as much of an eclectic and disparate range as possible in terms of sort of roots of life during this, during this conflict. Um, and so that was, that's, that was the guiding light for me, yeah. And, and so the book, it is a big canvas yeah. for such a little book. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, so it opens in the 1960s, late 1960s, yes. and ends in 2019? 2018, Two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> Total surprise, did not know that was gonna happen. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always knew I wanted to jump around in time. I just didn't think I would go that far. <laughs> so I take it from that you're not a, an outliner. I'm not an outliner, but I always think about when I was a kid, I would go to a museum and, you know, not just to go back to painting. And, and the paintings when I was young that had the most effect on me were, you know, these gigantic canvases by Hieronymus Bosch or Bruegel the Elder where, you know, they're huge and there are a million things going on all at once, right? And there's like, there's hell, there's heaven, there's a house on fire, there are horseback riders. Person falling from exactly. the sky, Exactly, um, and I always, I was always drawn to that, I think because of the multitude of lives and storylines and timelines and one canvas, um, which felt like the world to me. But I also, um, they all didn't seem to sort of connect in any direct way. Um, and so I wanted to try to connect them a little bit. And so in my mind mm -hmm. as a kid and, 
And I think that's, that's always, I think about that when I'm writing and, and creating books. I think about the, the, young, the young kid in me experiencing you know, a Bosch painting for the first time or a Bugle the Elder painting for the first time. Uh, uh, there's a blurb on the front of your, of your book called uh, from Marion Taves, mm -hmm, Marion yeah. Taves, who is a writer that I admire very much as well as... as um, she, I think she's one of our greats, yeah, yeah absolutely, yes. yeah. Um, but she said, she said, if you truly believe in the transformative power of literature, then you must read this book. Now, I don't disagree with you must read this book, but I, it started me thinking about, is, is literature, does it have the power to transform us? And I wanted to ask you that. Yeah, I mean, it certainly had the power and has the power to alter me. Um, and what I mean by that is I remember when people ask, you know, why did I become a writer? How did I start? All those questions. Um, I always think about reading books. I think I was in high school, reading these books that I had discovered. Um, for the first time, and, and it were, they were all contemporary fiction. They were living writers. I suddenly realized that this was a practicing art form. Mm -hmm. You know, it was being practiced today. Um, rather than, you know, I had grown up reading, you know, it was all Shakespeare and Dickens, right? So, right. Right. so this was a, this revelation to me that there were people who were still working on it. And I remember reading a few of those books and just getting to that last line closing the book and looking up and feeling as though my world had altered in some way. Um, you get that kind of skin tingling feeling. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that's hard to put into words. Um, it feels both kind of purely intellectual, but also really emotional as well. And, and I didn't know how to um, describe it. But what I did know was that I desperately, desperately wanted to respond to it in some way. Um, and, and that's how I started to write, was that there were books that altered me. What, um, do you know, can you remember some of them? Yeah, I remember reading Kazuo Ishiguro for uh -huh. the first time. Um, the, the early ones? The yeah, the early ones. Uh -huh. um, and I'm sure Remains of the Day was in that as well. Um, that was particularly uh, moving to me just as, a, as an Asian American to, to look at the back cover of Remains of the Day and see that um, this person was not, you know, uh, a white English butler, right? And so that was so radical to me, you know? Um, I know, I know. You know, you don't think of a white English butler as the most radical thing in the world, but, but for me, you <laughs> right, know, it of was. Course. I can't. How this person, who, who is Asian, yeah. um, and is is doing something that I never thought one could do, and so, that meant a lot to me too. Yeah. Reading Kazuo Ishiguro, so he was one of the writers, um, just on a just personal right. level. Yeah, yeah. There, there weren't a lot of, I'm trying to remember back when yeah. you would have been yeah. a kid, there weren't a lot of Asian writers being published no, even. I, I mean, think. surely there were some. Yeah, but yeah. it was, um, you know, it was Chang Rui Lee, right. it was Gish Jen, um, it was Kazuo Ishiguro. Right. Um, they're all amazing, you know, they're all, you know, have had a, a profound uh, Im impact on me. Right. Um, but it was also, you know, I'm trying to think, um, but it, it was also, you know, it was Ray Carver, it was Ann right. Beatty, you know, it was that, it was that generation right. of writers, Amy Hempel. Uh -huh. um, you know, and, and what I loved about all this was all their styles are so eclectic, um, and I loved it. I loved, I loved to read different styles, you know? Um, and so I was just consuming all this and, and desperately wanting to write back and to these books, essentially, right? Yeah. Um, and trying different things, like, you know, it's like, it's like someone learning how to walk for the first time. You just you're just kind of fumbling around, you know, right. um, like oh I'm gonna write like Ray Carver, right? Or I'm gonna write like Kazuo Ishiguro, right. but and just sort of doing it, you know, and giving yourself permission to do it. I, I was just thinking, what's so interesting about Ishiguro and Amy Hempel or yeah. Ann Beatty is that they is that their their writing is very pared down as well. Yeah. And that, that contrasting, yeah. you're, yeah, you're enjoying those with, right. with those right. huge right. Bosch paintings right. with all that right. going on. I know. To find that kind of balance. <laughs> yes, between exactly. Them. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, for, for a reader, not a writer, but for a reader, does literature transform us? I mean, I have to say, when yeah. I begin a book yeah. and I read that first paragraph, yeah. oftentimes it's like I'll immediately fall in love with 
the way the book is being told. Yeah. And those tingles that you described, yeah, yeah. that's what I as yeah. a reader get. Yeah. Is that is that transformative? Yeah, I, I think for me it is. I can't speak for everyone. Um, it stays with me. Um, it's, it's how I want to try. It always makes me want to try to be a better human because of that. Every time I read a great book, it makes me want to try to be a better human. Um, and, and that stays with me. Um, and so, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. So yeah. You've, writ you've written both um, and had a book of short stories published, Mountains. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and now two novels. Yeah. What do you find when when an idea comes to you? Yeah. Does it does it announce itself as a story or does it announce itself as a novel? Um, I think that sometimes this is may not be the best answer in the world, but sometimes I know that it, I intend to write a short story, uh -huh. and so I stick to that. Uh -huh. um, other times, I'm not entirely sure what it is. Um, and they end up being, for me, this sort of murky middle where they're not exactly short, they're not exactly novel length either. Mm -hmm. They're these sort of, I don't know, limbo stories, uh -huh. you know? Um, Midi. Yeah, I mean, that's a great <laughs> term. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and that's fine for me too. I think ultimately, regardless of whether it's, it's a short story or, or a novel, I'm always trying to pack as much in as possible um, in terms of layers of the world that I'm creating. Um, and if I can do that successfully in 10 pages, great. If I can do that in 250 pages, great. Um, and so, so that's sort of how I'm thinking of it. It's, it's less uh, the definition of a short story or novel or classification of that. It's less page count. It's, it's simply, can I achieve as many layers of the world as possible on the page? Um, in whatever project I'm working on. We talked, yeah. we, we were talking before yeah. we started taping, and one of the things that you said is that the characters in, um, that this, that Run Me to Earth grew out of a short story. Yeah. Could you talk about that experience of not wanting to leave those characters? Oh yeah, absolutely. So Run Me to Earth is, it's in some ways a sort of weird sequel to a long story of mine called Still a Fire, which is in the mountain. And that story is kind of revolves around, um, you know, post-World War II France and reconstruction and rebuilding lives after that. Um, and I had finished the story um, and, and I just, I knew that I had left my characters in sort of a limbo state. <laughs> And I knew that I wanted and to continue their story in some way, and but I just didn't know how. I knew that story was done within that world that I created, but I knew that I wanted to uh, continue them in some way, continue their lives in some way. Um, and then I've sort of, and so I had always been thinking about that. And then while I was working on this project, uh, I figured out that um, that's where this book was heading toward. Was that I was going to meet. Um, sort of spiritually, the characters that I created in Still a Fire. Are there other characters that you, I, I mean, there's a certain character, well, Noi, yeah. in, in this, in yeah. Run Me to Earth, that I just feel like I, I just want to know. I, I, I don't, I don't want to spoil anything, yeah. but I just want to know yeah. what happened. And you want that. You yeah. want us to have that feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to spoil anything no. for, right. you know, readers. Um, but there, but that for that particular character, I think there's also, you know, regardless of you know whether it's it's concrete or not, what happens for the reader, the the thing that's always kind of come up when I'm thinking about these stories of survival, um, and escape, fleeing and starting over again, are all the people who vanished, you know, who we lost track of, um, and and so. I was particularly thinking of Noi in that light, mm -hmm. yeah, when I was creating the story, yeah. When you're, is writing easy for you? No, <laughs> no, never, never. It's, it is the hardest thing that I will ever choose to do voluntarily. Life will throw a lot at us. Um, it has on a world level, personal level, um, but no one's, you know, no one's throwing writing at us. It's not something that we need to deal with. And so it is the hardest thing that we voluntarily choose to do, um, or at least it is for me. Yeah. 
Um, and I would much rather be playing with my dog or watching, you know, the next amazing Netflix TV series. And there are days when I do that. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you don't like have a regular writing schedule? <laughs> Not really. Um, when I'm with a, but when I'm really deep in a project, yes, I'm very regimented. I have to, I have to run with my dog in the morning and then drop him off, and then I have to go for a longer run, mm -hmm. and then after that, when my head is sort of clear, I write for a few hours every day. Do you find that you're running, that a lot of things. Well, I, I wa I'm a walker, yeah, a, yeah. Long, a long yeah. distance walker. And I find that when I'm walking and I'm in the midst of like a writing project or yeah. something, that questions that I've been f like kind of fussing with have their answer as a result of walking, even though I'm not thinking about it. Oh, them. absolutely. My, my mind sort of expands while I'm running. Um, and I'm able to, if I'm, if I'm stuck on a scene or if I'm yeah, stuck on where right. to go, um, inevitably, I'll figure it out while I'm running, um, even if I'm not consciously thinking of it. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think yeah. that's so amazing. I do too, which is why I just love it. I love it, um, and and yeah, no, I sort. I, so when you ask earlier, Nancy, you know that the, the headspace I was in working on this book, um, I think running also was a way to sort of cope with yeah. with you know some of the subject matter, right? right? And yeah. being in that headspace, yeah. Um, you're married to a writer. Yes, I am. Yeah, Laura, Laura Vandenberg. Vandenberg. Yep. Right. And is she your first reader? Yes. How do you? Yes. Um, and I think it's because when we first met about 16 years ago, we had we were just starting. We hadn't published anything, and so we were always our first reader. We were each our first readers. Mm -hmm. We grew up. That sort of we grew up writing together, you know, it's sort of part of our language, right. our love language almost, yeah. right? So um, that's integral. Um, and I remember, you know, our first apartment in Boston, under 400 square foot, and, you know, we both had sort of tiny desks, but the apartment was so small that you could sort of reach yeah. and just touch each other, right? right? And so that's sort of how we grew up. Um, and so, yeah, she's always my first reader. I have other readers as well, but she'll uh -huh. always be, yeah, yeah. yeah. Paul, I, I want to thank you so very much for coming on the show, and um, good luck with your writing. I know that um, we're going to be hearing a lot about you in the future. Oh, well you. deserved. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. It means a lot to me. Thank you.